Christ. You have your Bible, Esther chapter 1. If you haven't found it yet, you can find the book of Psalms. Then go back one book and you come to the book of Job. Go back another book and guess what? You arrive at Esther. Let me uh, give you a little bit of an advertisement. I uh, did uh, continued my study in the book of Daniel with my Sunday school this morning, but uh, I'm way in about Wednesday night. I may continue in the book of Esther on Wednesday night and then come back next week uh, and wrap up Esther. As you know, we've been on a two-year journey, uh, a survey of the Bible, and uh, we have... Uh, Really, I have at least thoroughly enjoyed the journey. I hope that you have as well. Esther is uh, a unique book in the scriptures. Um, so many dynamics of uh, throughout it. But there's one overriding fact. And that is the sovereignty of God. And so we're going to pray. The title of the message this morning is Never Bow to the Tyranny of the Wicked. Esther chapter 1, chapter 2, and actually four verses of Esther chapter 3. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving this uh, pastor an opportunity to open the word this morning. Uh, the freedom that I have to do so the patience of this church family to uh, be on this two-year journey that is now 18 months uh, into it as we uh, draw near to our close of the book of, uh, or rather the Old Testament. And so Lord, it's a joy that we come today to the book of Esther and are challenged by the testimony of the queen of Persia, Esther, but challenged by her adopted father, Mordecai, the Jew, and how he stood. In fact, the book of Esther ends with a testimony, not of the queen, but of this man that we will focus on towards the end of this hour. Lord, may you raise up Mordecai's in our church today, men and women that will just stand. Lord, that will never bow to the wicked, we would uh, desire so much to, in the hour that we're tested, to be found to have the uh, strong uh, back to stand up to that which is wicked. Lord, we've celebrated today the heritage of our nation. And I just pray that you would stir within our hearts to be unapologetic about the heritage that we have and the foundation upon which this nation was built, and that is the very word of God. And so, Lord, bless now. May we be challenged, stirred by the truths that we find here. Give this pastor uh, the ability to communicate truths and, uh, and such that they will be understood. And to that end, I ask that you bless now in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your outline, again, the title, Never Bow to the Tyranny of the Wicked. And I wanted to begin with an overriding statement regarding the book of Esther. And that is that the book of Esther is a testimony of God providentially, or we could even say sovereignly, orchestrating the affairs of man and nations to accomplish his eternal purpose and good for his people. You would say, does God have an interest in his people and us, particularly as believers, in this hour? And the answer is absolute. Our God is very interested in our lives and the unfolding of the affairs of the nation in which we live. And I think you and I particularly have a great challenge before us, and that is to accept our duty and our responsibility in this day, may God find us faithful. Let me introduce to you the book of Esther. Esther is regarded as really one of the most unique books of the scriptures, and particularly the Old Testament. In fact, it is only one of two books in the scriptures in which the Lord or God's name is not mentioned. And yet, from the beginning of Esther all the way to the end of chapter 10, there is the undeniable reality of the hand of God guiding and directing, even 
through the heathen of that day, his ultimate purpose, and by the way, preservation for his people. Now, as you open your Bible to Esther chapter 1, I would invite you to understand the historical setting of the hour. The king of Persia is Ahasuerus. He is the grandson of Cyrus the Great. He is the son of King Darius the First. And he is also the father of Artaxerxes. He is at this moment, as you open your Bible, the king of the most powerful nation and empire of the world in that day. Now, the book of Esther and the events that are found here would fall somewhere between the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. In fact, we'll be looking, Lord willing, at Nehemiah uh, in a couple more weeks. And so as you open your Bible, the year is 483 B.C. It is the third year of the king Ahasuerus. Rome, at this point in history, is still a, a small fledgling city-state. Greece is now reaching the pinnacle of its assault on Persia as an empire. And Persia as a nation is past its peak as a nation and people. And so if you have your Bible, I do invite you to look with me and we'll read the first two verses. Many of the verses will not be on the PowerPoint this morning. And so I will warn you concerning that. Let's read Esther chapter 1. You follow in verse 1 and 2. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia. Over a hundred and twenty, uh, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. That in those days when the king of Heshuar sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. Now, the setting of this passage of scripture is at the summer palace of the king. Now, we are looking at the area of today's uh, Iran, Iraq, and the empire that. Uh, Ahasuerus is reigning over, reaches all the way down into Africa, throughout the Middle East, and as far as India. There are 127 different provinces. Each of them have a governor who is watching after the affairs of the state of Persia. Now, I'm going to invite you to consider with me a little bit further as we read, continuing at verse 3. And in the third year of his reign, he, Ahasuerus, made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. Let me help you fill in the outline just a little bit this morning. The first thing I want you to notice as we look through the scriptures is that there are three banquets that are mentioned in Esther chapter 1. Now, the first banquet we've already seen stated here in this opening verse, in verse 3, the third year, he made a feast. Now, at this feast were the nobles of his kingdom. They are the governors of his kingdom. They are the ones that are watching after his realm as the monarch of Persia. We read in verse 4, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and four score days. And so this first banquet will last a hundred and eighty days. And then it will be followed by a second and a third banquet. Now you're going to say, what does this have to do with anything? You're going to see in a moment. I want you to look then at verses 5 through 8 with me this morning. And so after the first banquet was over, we read, And when those days were expired, the king made a second feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace. 
both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So the first banquet was for the nobles, the leaders of Persia. This banquet, I, I would draw it somewhat as a, a parallel with, um, with uh, the presidents of our nation when they throw a big state affair. But instead of just inviting the nobles, the second feast, they opened the doors to all the common people. So you could imagine all of us rushing into the White House. Well, maybe you couldn't, but just try to imagine, all right? And so we're rushing in, and there's going to be this great feast, and it will last for seven days. In verse 6, we see a description of the palace. Here we read, where were white, green, and blue awnings, hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver ring, and pillars of marble. The beds were, or beds or the couches, were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble. So you can imagine the, the richness of this palace. Now, all of this is being done that Ahasuerus might impress upon the people the wealth and the strength of his nation, the nation of Persia. But as we'll see, that nation is already beginning to fail. In verse 7, we'd see a description of the feast itself, the seven days. In fact, we read again in verse 7, And they gave them drink, that is drink uh, wine, in abundance. In verse 8, And drinking was according to the law. None to compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers, uh, officers of his house, that they should do according to every man's pleasure. In other words, drink as much as you want to drink. And so we're watching a feast here recorded that really turns into not just a banquet, but it turns into an affair of debauchery. And you're going to see that as it unfolds. Now, there's a third banquet. The third banquet is one for the women of Shushan. And we read regarding that banquet. And also Vashti, the queen, made a feast. For the women in the royal house in the palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now, for your outline, Queen Vashti then hosted a third banquet. It coincided with the drunken banquet of the king and all of the men of the city who are gathered with him. And then that brings us to another thought then. The king, in his drunken state plunged Persia into a royal crisis. Now follow with me in the scriptures what begins to happen beginning in verse 10. Because in verse 10, in his drunken mind, he decides to do something that is going to cause a crisis. Not just at the palace, but a crisis across Persia. And that is that he summons his queen and it begins a confrontation. If you have your Bible, consider then verse 10, Esther 1 in verse 10. And on the seventh day, that is the seventh day of the feast, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he was drunk. He commanded, verse 11, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal. Now let's back up. Where is the king? He's in the midst of all of the people of Shushan. And he and they are drunkards. They're all drunk, all right? And so the king gets into his mind to summon the most beautiful woman of the realm, and that is his queen, Vashti. And his purpose is found in verse 11. And it was to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair or pleasing to look upon. Now, an interpretation of this verse is that it can read to bring Vashti the queen before the king with only her crown royal. In other words, wearing nothing but the crown. He was doing it for the purpose that those men might look upon her and her beauty. That brings us to another thought then. The queen's noble response. 
the queen's noble response. And so consider with me then verse 12. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment. By his chamberlains, I can't help but smile. I just think I'm living with a woman that's got a strong will. And for me to command something that is absolutely wrong, it would not go well at home. Maybe at your home it would, but it wouldn't go well. And so here is the queen. The most powerful man of the day is her husband. He summons her, come wearing perhaps only your crown. But remember where she is. All the women of the city are with her at her banquet. And so the summons arrives to the queen. And the chamberlains come and they tell the queen, you are summoned by the queen. Well, the Bible tells us in verse 12, she refused. And therefore, it was the king very wroth, very angry, overcome with anger. And his anger burned in him. Now, we're going to keep going. I know you would love to hear me do some editorializing with that, but I'm not going to do it. All right. Now, humiliated though. Now, the king sought the counsel of his wise men. You know, one of the things I've learned in life is that leaders are only as good as their counselors. Whoever they have around them is a reflection on who they are, inevitably. And a wise leader is always going to seek talented people that bring understanding and insight and discern dangers. Uh, sadly, that wasn't the case for Ahasuerus. He desired ultimately to demand of the queen that which would humiliate her. Now remember who she is. She's not only the queen of Persia, but she is the mother of Artaxerxes. He is the heir to the father's throne. And so there is not only the dignity of her office, but there's the dignity of her motherhood that is at stake. And therefore she refused the king. But there is a law of the Medes and the Persians. That once a king makes an edict, he cannot what? He cannot change it. And so he has summoned the queen and his authority is absolute. But apparently the queen did not get that word, right? You might be absolute everywhere else, but when it comes to this moral demand, absolutely not. And so he turns to his counselors. In Esther chapter 1 and verse 15, the king asks his counselors, what shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law? I always find it interesting when a leader is going to be a fool, it's no longer me, it's we. What are we going to do, right? And so that's what we find here. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law? Because the law says that the king cannot change his command. Once it is said, it is an absolute. Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king, Ahasuerus, by the chamberlains, by the eunuchs, by the servants. And then we read in verse 20 and 21. Well, go to your Bible. This is not on the PowerPoint. So let me take you to your Bible. And let's pick up a little bit of the, the story that we find here. And so... We're going to look at, uh, well, the names of, of the, the counselors we find in verse 14. And then in verse 15, we actually find the question, what shall we do unto the queen? Verse 16, one of the counselors, Mamukan, answered before the king and the princes. And you can see him stand and, and he's eloquently addressing all the leaders now who are being invited to give counsel. Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. All right, now let's back up. Where is Queen Vashti when she says to the king, not going to happen? She's with all the women, right? 
So all the women are, are looking at the queen. And the queen says, go to the king and tell him, ain't going to happen. And so he gets the word, she's not coming. And so this counselor stands and he says, listen, she's not only offended you, she's offended all of us. And then he draws the reasoning in verse 17 that her influence on the other women. And they will despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. And the king of Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deeds of the queens. Thus uh, shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. E essentially, the women are going to start thinking on their own. And we can't have that. Can't have that at all. Don't think. Just look pretty, women. Just look pretty. Verse 19. I hope you know I'm kidding, right? All right, verse 19. If it please the king, then, this is the advice, let there go a royal commandment from him. Let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered. That Vashti come no more before her king or before the king Ahasuerus. Let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And so we pick it up. Verse 20. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire for it is great. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor both to the great and the small. Now, verse 21, and the saying, please the king. He says, sounds good to me. And all the princes, they all agree. And the king did according to the word of Mamukan. It's amazing how foolish we can be sometimes, men, right? It's one thing to be a fool. It's quite another to drive off the cliff. And that is exactly what Ahasuerus is going to do. And so we come to verse 22. That the king sends out letters into all the king's provinces. 127 of them. Into every province according to the writing thereof. And to every people according to their language. That every man should bear rule in his own house. That it should be published according to the language of every people. So if any of the men here have this idea of woman, I'm the king of this domain. Well, you take after another man and he's a fool and his name is Ahasuerus. All right. There should be rising within the women here in our church, a desire to be treated like a queen and to be honored. There should be a desire of the queens to have men that act with not only authority, but out of love. And that is what is missing in this picture. This is a fool who is about to take a path that will not only isolate him from the woman that has stood beside him and has given birth to the son that will be the king of Persia, but this is a man that is about to make one of the worst decisions of his reign as king. Not a whole lot of comments this morning. So maybe you're sitting there in fear. Right? Well let's go a little bit further. And the king remembered Vashti. And so let's pick up the story here in verse 1. And after these things. After what things? After uh, Ahasuerus uh, basically dethroned Vashti, sent her away. She's banished from the palace. Her lands have been given to another. And so she is literally left as a woman without an estate at all. She's been banned from the kingdom. And so after these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased or pacified, he remembered Vashti. And what she had done and what was decreed against her. Let me give you some word meanings. He remembered. The word remembered is that her memory burned in his heart. He remembered. After his anger was appeased, after his drunken stupor was passed, he had paused to then reflect. On what he had done. How she had responded. And then the edict. That ultimately banned her from the kingdom. I want to give you some thoughts to go with that. And give you a little bit of history. The king in verse 1. I believe was haunted. By remorse. 
Let me give you some background of things that you don't know. The events that occur in Esther chapter 2 happen about two to three years after Esther chapter 1. And so we begin with 483 B.C. And now we find ourselves around 480 B.C. History fills in the blank of what happened in that two to three years. For it was when Ahasuerus went to wage war against Greece. And so his soldiers go to war against Greece, but they also send a small Persian navy. That navy engages Greece, but Greece was a nation built on islands. It had a strong navy. And as a result of that, Ahasuerus and Persia suffered a humiliating defeat. Ahasuerus lost his navy. And so when you come to Esther chapter 2 and verse 1, after these things, after his navy is lost, after he has been humiliated and demoralized as a king of Persia, after he's starting to see the handwriting, so to speak, on the wall of the future of Persia, after these things, I've imagined what it must have been like to come home from that battle. And now he has suffered defeat. There's not a parade to celebrate his coming. In fact, I would think even the servants in his palace scattered. For who knows how to approach a king who comes home in great humili humility, humiliation, demoralized. But then I thought, and I wanted to share this with you. As he entered the gilded doors of the palace, there was silence. Vashti was not there. She was not there to greet him, to encourage him, to embrace him, or to comfort him. And so Ahasuerus remembered Vashti. Consider then as we move forward, forward, verses 2 through 4, the servants observing the king's state, his servants had a solution. And that is, well, let's just choose another queen. And so we have the unfolding of what many might would observe to be a, a beauty contest. Beginning in verse 2 and going through verse 4, the advice of the servants of the king was send out people, servants, and seek out the most beautiful women in the Persian Empire. Choose the virgins of your empire and bring them to Shushan. And there choose among them the one that will be the queen. Jewish historian Josephus writes that there were 400 women gathered to the king, the most beautiful women of the land. Among the 400, there was one whose name was Hadassah. Her Persian name was Esther. And so as the 400 women are brought to the palace, Esther is among them. We read in verse 5 and 6, Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. In verse 7, this Mordecai brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, who was his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother. And the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. It's a fascinating reading. I wish we had time to, to delve into it. But the sum of it is this. 
Mordecai is a powerful, influential, and appears to be a wealthy man. And in Shushan, you'll find that he sits at the gate. And so he's in a place of authority and a place of influence. He has a daughter who he, he has adopted. And so this Esther has experienced in her youth already the deaths of both her father and mother. He, really being a cousin, an elder cousin, takes Esther into his household. And he makes her his daughter. And then we consider this thought then, and the Lord blessed Esther. In fact, you're going to read as she was brought to the palace, that she immediately by her beauty, but also by her spirit, she gained the favor of everyone. The first one that is mentioned is found in verse 9. And he is really the, the supreme authority over the king's harem. And so she obtains the favor of Haggai, the chamberlain of the harem. And we read, And the maiden pleased him, Haggai, as she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her things up for purification with such things as belonged to her. And seven maidens who attended to her which were meet to be given her and out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids, the seven servants, unto the very best of the house of the women. And so now for the next year, this young Jewish virgin, Hadassah, Esther, will be housed in a harem with perhaps as many as four Hundred women. Now understand of those 400 women that they all are vying for the king's attention. At hand is the opportunity of spending the rest of their life in luxury and being pampered. But to not be chosen will mean that you will be rejected and isolated in the harem along with the other concubines. And so there's much that we might say is at risk. Now, in verse 15, you read that she was not only the favorite of Hege, but she also became the favor of all of the servants. And so we read in verse 15, now, when the turn of Esther to be with the king, the daughter of Abihel, the son of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king. She required nothing. But what Haggai the king's chamberlain. The keeper of the women appointed. And Esther obtained favor. In the sight of all them. That looked upon her. I'm going to use a word that. Is the antitype of who Esther is. And it's the word entitlement. We live in a culture today. In which our children feel entitled. And we have done that. We, the parents and grandparents, we have done that. We have given our children the idea that they deserve everything. And contribute nothing. We have, living in the midst of a culture... That will protest and riot. Because they are entitled. But can I say to you. Especially to our young people. The spirit of entitlement is ugly. It is an evil spirit. It is a proud spirit. What we see with Esther is exactly the opposite of that. What we see here is that when her time came and everything that she had ever known, everything that she had ever loved as far as being with her family, her, her Hebrew background, all of that right now is in chaos in her life. Her very life is dependent upon the whims of the, la of the king who the last woman before her has already been sent away from the kingdom. And yet we read here, she required what? Nothing. There's a great lesson in that. 
The spirit is one of humility. And sadly, it's something that's not found. And yet, she found favor. Because she required nothing of all them. Consider then, if you would, a verse. Hebrews 12, verse 15. Gives us a brief lesson on bitterness. Read it with me. Would you read it out loud? Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Esther might have had cause to be bitter, don't you think? Her mom was dead. Her father was dead. She was living in the household with an elder cousin who will find commanded her life. She was then taken from that household where she was loved and protected and placed in a harem with perhaps 400 other women. She had absolutely no control of her life as far as her destiny. But what she did have control of was her attitude. She chose not to be bitter. Instead, she required nothing. It's a wonderful lesson. Then consider, thirdly, she was discreet and obedient. In chapter 2 and in verse 10, you find those there. Verse 10, I can't remember if it's up here or not. Yeah, in verse 10, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. In other words, she did not reveal to anyone at the palace that she was a daughter of Hebrews. She was a Jew of the captivity. And why did she do that? Because Mordecai, her adopted father, had charged her, do not reveal your heritage. Another verse, verse 20. She obeyed Mordecai. And you find that she did so from her youth to the crowning as the queen. We read here in Esther 2 and verse 20. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people. As Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai. Like as when she was brought up with him. Let me say this to our young people. Your parents' goal in life is not to make your life miserable. The challenge of your parents, and especially that of your father, if you are a daughter, especially, is to love you and to cherish you. And to overshadow you. Not because they're trying to squeeze your life and, and conform you to whatever their demands are. But because out of love, that's what fathers and mothers do. Mordecai's counsel was valued by Esther even after she became the queen. Now understand, the king had absolute authority. But her respect and honoring her father, Mordecai, was never sacrificed. If you want to be in a place that God blesses, honor the authorities God places in your life. Let me take you another step further and then we're going to look at a lot of scripture. And it is this. Esther won the king's heart. And she became the queen of Persia. While still concealing that she was Hebrew lineage. You have your Bible and we won't have time to read all of this. But would you look with me at Esther chapter 2. And just going to look at several things. Uh, these are not on the PowerPoint. And so we read, I'm going to pick it up. Verse 15 again. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, this uncle of Mordecai taken Esther for his daughter, was come to go unto the king. She required nothing. Verse 16. And so Esther was taken into King Ahasuerus into his royal palace, house royal, in the tenth month, which is the month Tabith, in the seventh year of his reign. 
Now understand, this night she will lose her virginity. Verse 17. And the king loved Esther above all the women. Now watch this. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And then in verse 18, the king made a great feast unto all his princes, that is the governors and servants, even Esther's feast, a feast in her honor. And he made a release to the provinces and he gave gifts according to the state of the king. That is, he lifted the burden of the taxes. And when the virgins were gathered together, that is assembled, the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Now, the story here and to the end of this message turns to Mordecai. In fact, the book is titled Esther. But the fact is that Mordecai, her father, has this overarching presence. And the scriptures, if you read, I think it's today's devotion, actually ends with Mordecai. So Mordecai is this great personality, this godly man that will now really take the pages of the scripture for us to follow. So let's follow him. Notice then with me, if you would, Mordecai's godly character and his fortitude. So let me give you some uh, quick uh, three thoughts. The first is this. He was a loving father and guarded and encouraged Esther. We read in chapter 2 and verse one, 11. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. That's the heart of a father. She's in the harem. He can do nothing to get her out of the harem. The king's authority is absolute. And so Mordecai must trust the sovereignty of God regarding his children. This daughter that he no longer has authority over. He cannot help her. He cannot, reach, he cannot rescue her. And so the only thing that he could do is to be present in her life every day. As close as he could, he was there. I'd say to every father that's here this morning, be as close as you can. But understand, when that daughter becomes the wife of another, the authority to rescue is limited. But it doesn't mean that you don't have the presence and the opportunity to be there. And so he was there for Esther. As a loving father would desire to be. He could not rescue her from where she was. But he could be there and be present. Here's another. He was a loyal subject to the king. It's an interesting story that ends Esther chapter 2. And it is the story of when Mordecai is sitting in the gate of the king. So he is a man in, in great authority. Influence. Perhaps he's even ruling and judging matters for the king of Persia. And so he's sitting in this gate and he overhears a conversation or he learns about a plot of two of the chamberlains. And it is a plot at the end of verse 21 to lay hold or to assassinate the king. Now we read in verse 22, and the thing was known to Mordecai who told it unto Esther the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. That's important. He, she made sure that the king, her husband, knew that Mordecai was the one that was looking out for his life. Now that will do him well down the road here in a few years. And so we read then in verse 23. And when inquisition was made of the matter. It was found out. And therefore they were both hanged on a tree. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Now remember that. I'm not going to continue with that one. We'll pick that up maybe on Wednesday night. Now we come to the third one. And this will kind of wrap it up. He was a man of conviction. And he refused to bow to the wicked. And so we've seen he was a godly father. He loved his daughter. And he was as close as he could be for her. Even as she became queen. The second thing we've seen is that he's a loyal subject. He was there and he intervened as a subject of the king. And then thirdly, 
He was a man of conviction. And he refused to bow to the wicked. Now you know this story, many of you. So let's read it. You follow as I read. And after these things, after everything that just occurred. And the attempt of assassination. And, and it was thwarted by the intervention of Mordecai. Who told Esther who went to the king. After these things, Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus, promoted Haman. Now who is this Haman that is promoted. Well, let me go further and read through this. So after these things did King Ahasuerus promote or magnify or put in a place of power and authority, Haman, the son of Hamadatha, that is the father of Haman, the Agathi, now, and advanced him, promoted him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And so the picture there is that this Haman was given a canopy, and so he is sitting in a position of authority over even the people that are sitting at the gate. And there is a canopy over him. And so you can kind of picture this proud Haman walking through the streets. And the servants are carrying a canopy. And they're shading him as he goes. And everybody is going to know by the approach of Haman that this is a man of power and authority. A man that is preferred by the king. And so we come to verse 2. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate, which is where Mordecai sat. Said, they bowed and they reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Now that's interesting. He is loyal to the king. We've already seen that. But when it comes to the matter of Haman, who is a wicked, evil man. He is the enemy of God's people. Although the king had given an edict that everybody must bow and reverence Haman when he passes, there was one man that said, I will not bow to a man like Haman. Now verse 3. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, and they said unto Mordecai, why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Why do you disobey the king's commandment? After all, everybody's supposed to bow and reverence Haman. And then we read, And it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, this was happening every day, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters, opinion, understanding would stand. And then we close. For he had told them that he was what? A Jew. He was numbered among God's people. Let me close today. As you look at this story about Haman, you look at a man that is a wicked man. His political ambitions had promoted him to the point of being second only to the king of Persia. And the king of Persia had said, everybody of my realm must bow and reverence Haman. But there was one man that said, I will not bow, nor will I reverence such a man. Because I am a Jew. Let me ask you this morning as I close. Do you have in your life... Principles and convictions that you will not compromise even at the risk of your life or your welfare. Are there places in your life that you will say, I draw the line there for I am a believer. I will not bow before wicked men. Nor will I bow to a government that demands and legislates matters that are wicked and immoral. I will not. I'm not talking revolution. But I'm talking having the backbone that you are a man or a woman of principle. And you would say, there are some matters that I will not compromise. For 
several years now, we have watched our nation lose its moral compass. And if we're honest, we're like a ship without an anchor anymore. Our anchor historically would have been the fundamentals, and the principles and the precepts of God's word. But sadly, we live in a nation that is morally adrift. And the majority of churches and pastors today have abdicated the authority and the responsibility of saying, if you are a believer, you must have convictions that you will not alter and you will not bow. For instance, and there's so many I could give you, I believe that we were born into this world with liberty and freedom. This is given to us by God. When God created man, he gave man, Adam and Eve, free will. Of the garden of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. But nevertheless, the tree was there. For Adam and for Eve, there was the free will choice to obey God or to disobey God. And sadly, they yielded to the temptation and they sinned. You are, as a man or as a woman, a person to whom God has given soul liberty. The right and the freedom of making principled choices. You will be held accountable by God for the choices that you make. Our liberties are not given to us by government. We give to government its authority. Not government gives to us our liberties. As a people and as a church this morning, I want to challenge you as I close on this patriotic Sunday that you will accept the fact that we have soul liberty. It's the liberty that Esther experienced when though she was taken by the king's servants and placed in the harem, she had to choose her attitude and her response to her authority. Now that authority was an absolute human authority. It's very different than our government. Our government is based on we the people. And we give government authority. But we also have the liberty, the right to take that authority away. When that government chooses to violate our liberties, our freedoms. We're living in that culture. The next election is going to determine, are we satisfied with the course that we're on as a nation? Because it is a course and a path that is taking from us every day more and more liberties. Many of you took the shot, the jab. I'm not here to debate it. But I'm saying to you, it was a violation of your soul liberty to try to mandate something that was untried, untested, and the government says, trust us. But some of you did trust the government. And I'm not here to debate that part, but I'm here to say that COVID became a catalyst for us to continue to lose liberty after liberty after liberty. You and I have to, as individual soul liberty, 
determine if we will bow to the wicked or if we'll say, I will not bow to a wicked, immoral authority. I will pray for that authority, but I will not give my liberty to a wicked, immoral man or woman. Mordecai had to make that decision, and it was a life or death decision. And the Bible says that every day they kept asking Mordecai, why? Why aren't you bowing to, to Haman according to the king's command? And finally, Haman said, because I'm one of God's people, I am a Jew. So I ask you this morning, are you a believer? And if you are, do you believe, as the Bible teaches, that you have the liberty of choice, a free will liberty that God has given you? Because you are a unique creation of God. There has not been another like you. And God is interested in you personally and individually. Whether it's Esther, who sees the sovereign hand of God leading, and she accepts God's plan. Or it's Mordecai who sits in the gate, and he recognizes that to not stand and then bow to this wicked man may cost me my life. And Mordecai says, but I'm a Jew, and I will not bow to the wicked. Brethren, every day of our life, we have that choice. And it might be, as Daniel, was a friend's experience, it might be to bow or to what or to burn. But will you set in stone, I will not compromise my faith and my relationship with God and bow to the wicked?